Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the benefits of healthy peatlands. So we all want healthy rivers. We all want healthy fish populations in them. We're learning more and more about the need to bring back natural processes to encourage rivers to act to function more naturally. That's sorry. To, to act more naturally, to function naturally, and we need to manage particularly at a catchment wide scale. We, and that's a collective we, have, have focused often our, our, our work process, our work that we do, within the very close riparian zones and areas. That's important. If we want shade, a watercourse, we need to plant a tree right in the watercourse. We may be clearing conifer regen to allow more natural vegetation along river banks. But we need to look at the wider scale. You know, a sick plantation like that, that might cover three, 400 meters, we have to be realistic and realize a 15 meter buffer zone is not enough to protect that water necessarily from the problems. So we need to think big. We always need to be thinking catchment scale. Everything that's flowing into that water, that is what is key and that was what will influence particularly water quality and water quantity. Two really important things to us all. This is typically what Galloway uplands of Galloway look like. We have a river at the bottom of the valley there. In recent years, we've got wind farms coming in. We've got large new road networks coming across into these areas and we've got six being planted, then being felled, and then being replanted. And I'd be naive to think that all of these land uses aren't impacting the water at the bottom of the hill. So peatland. So as this map shows here, it's a very, very key part of, of the catchments. It's nearly a quarter of Scotland is covered by peatlands. So the majority of catchments, peatland will be a very key part of that. We've got a picture here on the left-hand side. This is the, the River Luce, which is near Shinrar. And you can see in that catchment, it's nearly half of that catchment is peat. So the quality and health of that peatland is really, really important to that river. And that's about 17,000 hectares of peatland in that one catchment. So it's a big part of the overall catchment. So what is a peatland? So a functional, healthy peatland. It's a terrestrial wetland ecosystem. It's waterlogged. Anyone who's walked on a good, healthy peatland, it's wet. The whole thing normally ripples as you walk across it. There's a very, very high water table, and that's what's absolutely key. The bog vegetation that lives on it, it's a sphagnum moss. If you pick it up and squeeze it, it's mostly water. It all comes out. It's all, it's all about the water being right up at the top here. And it's sphagnum mosses for healthy peatland. Yeah, that's what you need to have in sedges. And this is anaerobic, it's this lack of oxygen because of the water, which is so important to the health of the peatland, because it's that that stops proper decomposition of these mosses and other plants. And that's what starts to build up, and it doesn't decompose. And a peatland is this sort of live ecosystem, and it's growing. It goes up by roughly a millimetre a year. So it is growing all the time. And these are lovely pictures that we've got here of what a healthy peatland should look like and it's very important we all know it's very important for um, storing carbon that's been the main driver of a lot of the peatland restoration projects it supports important ecosystems of its own for biodiversity importance very important but particularly for for the work that we're all doing it has a, a key role with regard to the health of, of the of the rivers and it improves water quality it absorbs pollutants sulfur dioxides nitrogens and heavy metals over many years. It's a natural filter at the very top or within, within the catchments. It helps to regulate water flows. So you should get delayed flood peaks on longer periods of higher water and particularly increased low flows. That's a, an increasing concern that we've all got about these really drought conditions in the summers. So the peatland within the catchment is very, very important to benefit the, the aquatic fish and invertebrates in the downstream waters, a key component. But more than a third of Scotland's peatlands are damaged. That's over 600,000 hectares. And it's nearly all been damaged by lowering this water table. So it's so critical to peatland to have this water sitting right, right near, very near the top of the surface. And in Galloway, 
the big driver for a lot of the, the, the damage to our peatlands was when the forestry was large scale forestry planting. So in, from the 1950s through to the 60s and into the 70s, we had large scale tree planting. Over a third of Dumfries and Galloway is, is under trees, and most of that is, is commercial forestry. The forestry didn't particularly want to plant in peatland. It's not a great place to plant trees, that's why they have to drain it, but it was very available and it was cheap land to buy. And it was significant, covered huge areas of the uplands of Galloway in these relatively short period of time from the 1950s onwards. And you can see this very, very effective drainage, this ploughing, um, you know, every two to three metres ploughing all of the hillsides. It's not only forestry, this is a picture from, from the Loose. So the Loose is one of the least forested catchments in Galloway that we work on. And it's heavily grazed by sheep at the top. And you can see, hopefully, from the image there, you can see all of these drainage ditches. So the 17,000 hectares of peatland, all of it is heavily, heavily drained. Any area photograph that you have a look at, this is from roughly the center of the top. Um, is it so top of the, the river catchment within the top there and you can see this drainage and we can look at some of these aerial photographs and find out where the deepest peat is by just where the drains get closer and closer because these these drains are roughly 50 meters apart all across this 17,000 hectares so a colossal drainage and very effective program when that came in I think that was in about the 60s early 1970s that this came in drained all of these huge areas Degraded peatland is, is very easy to recognize. And we had this lovely picture previously of a functioning peatland. This is what many areas look like. It starts to become very visible. You can see the peatland. Uh, it's eroding, it's cracking, it's washing away. It's bare often, so there's nothing holding it together. It blows away when it gets dry. Um, the picture at the bottom, right-hand picture, is one of these gullies that have become very, very active. So something that grows at a millimetre a year, you can lose metres, lose literally metres in a year. And we're getting more and more of these flood events and more and more of this washing away. And it goes someplace. It has to, it washes down. The drains are there to basically take water away, but it also takes the peat as it destroys. And that is what ends up into the burns and the rivers downstream. Water quality is particularly the thing that impacts in Galloway. So you can see from, from, from this diagram up here, it's increasing the dissolved organic carbon. So it's making the waters very, very dark and peaty. And we're picking up really high water temperatures in some places. The River Bladnock, which is quite heavily impacted, we recorded 29 degrees in the water in 2021 in the main river, main stem further down. So it's getting really, really hot. And we believe this is partly because of the amount of peat within the water. We're also getting toxic metals starting to come out. So all this sort of stories that's gone on for all these years is coming out very, very quickly. So not only did, does a functioning peatland help store and remove this, but once it starts to degrade, it releases everything that's held and, and stops collecting any more as it comes in. And the, this, this pollution um, starts to lower particular acidification you're all aware, Galloway has a lot of acidification. Most of the driver is coming from conifers planted on deep peats, where we've got this damage to these deep peats. And when we get these low pHs, that's particularly damaging for salmon eggs. We've got a picture at the right-hand side. These eggs will not hatch if they're in acid. The enzyme they release that splits the egg into two and allows the shell into two to come out, that doesn't work if it's in a low pH. So they die under the gravel, recruitment failure. Or for older fish and invertebrates, toxic aluminium. So when you get a low pH, you get um, aluminium forms in the soil, turns into label aluminium, which is a highly toxic to invertebrates and fish. It affects the gills, especially osmoregulation. So even if they survive in the river, when they smolt and go to sea, they can't, they can't adapt to the change of habitat. They die at that stage. So particularly big impacts on, on fish populations, which we are very aware of. In Dumfries and Galloway. And we know this through water quality monitoring. We have quite an extensive water quality programme, and that's supported by Peatland Action because it is focused on areas where peat, damaged peat, is, is the major problem. And this programme is to help understand the issue, but it's also to try and promote and prioritise where the best places to undertake peatland restoration would be. 
So this is quite, we use songs, we use spot sampling, and this is the sort of results that we get from lot, lots of places. <coughs> pH 5 is the area that we're particularly critical. So consistent pH is below 5 means that unlikely for salmon and trout populations to survive, and we have weeks, sometimes months, that some of the, these areas in the winter and the spring is below this critical temperature. And that stops the recruitment and the recovery of salmon trout stocks. And then we have key areas that we're particularly interested in. These are some of the, the sort of change of focus that have been supported through peatland action. So this example here, um, this burn runs from left to right. And these are pH readings. So we have a pH reading of just over five, so acceptable for fish on the left-hand side. We then have this burn coming in. And there's a picture of it on the left-hand side. That's a very heavily degrading um, drainage, artificial drainage ditch that drains some deep peat that's been forested and heavily drained. And we get in nearly p just below pH 4, th this flush of very, very acidic water coming in from the side here. And this is logarithmistic, log getting confused here, but um, so it's very, very um, acidic, far more acidic by up to one pH unit drop is, is a tenfold increase of the actual acidity in there. So, um, when you have something like that, that's highly, highly acidic water. And you can see just downstream of that reduces it to below five. So we're trying to identify these key locations where we got these hot spots of low acidification coming in to try and address those as key areas for peatland restoration. And the data is supported, the water quality data is supported by the fish densities. So this is a, a picture from the fleet, which is heavily um, forested and peat at the very top of this, this river. This map shows areas, accessible areas to salmon. So we're only looking at areas where we've removed any other barrier apart from water quality. So in here you can see the top of the river, absolutely no salmon able to survive in those areas, even though they're large enough, they're accessible, and there's good in-stream habitat there. But peatland restoration, can be undertaken, and this is you know, a major driver for us and, and, and an opportunity to recover these poor areas. The concept is quite simple. You need to raise the water table back up. You need to block drains. You need to revegetate maybe bare peat hags. If you're getting particularly large scale amounts of erosion in these areas, you can't get vegetation back onto them. You can smooth them off, stopping burning and controlling these, these really bad erosion areas. And there's good techniques there's good experts out there and a growing expertise and understanding. And one that we are particularly interested in, we really, you know, this is, this is I find it staggering. I had no idea that you could actually do this to start with. In my opinion, once you'd plant an area was sick and you felled it, that was it. It was going to have to stay under, under conifers f forever more, pretty much, you know, or, or just have nothing on it, like scrubland. But there is a technique of forestry to bog restoration. These guys go on with quite lightweight diggers. They, they flip the stumps, conifer stumps, they bury them, they bury any trash as well underneath. They smooth off the surface, they bond around the side and they raise the water table. And this example, of some work near Newton Stewart that we were involved with, paid for by Peatland Action and undertaken by Crichton Carbon Centre. And you can see this area here, I think that's about 30 hectares, and you can see the water table sitting on the top already. So that was a Sitka plantation. It was felled, it was left for a number of years, and then they've gone in and they've ground smoothed it all off, and, and that is back to being a peatland area again. And the water table raised right up and the whole thing smoothed off. Really, really impressive stuff. And in our opinion, the main message we want to keep getting across to everybody is we believe there should be no replanting of, of Sitka on deep peats. So if anyone's planting new areas, it's very strict, deep peat, which the definition is 50 centimetres, you're not, you're not allowed to plant conifers on any of those areas of deep peats because recognized um, problems, particularly if you, know, you lose more uh, carbon than, than you gain from doing that. But you are allowed to continue to replant peat so if, uh, on deep peat. So if you have trees that were planted in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, when you fell those, you're allowed to replant. And there are some limitations um, to dissuade it. 
Uh, Forest and Land Scotland definitely seems to be starting to take a new policy, which is wonderful. But the private sector, in many cases, is still allowed to replant on deep peats, and that is something that needs to change. <coughs> so just a few key points here. There is a lot of support, there's a lot of expertise, a lot of training, a lot of funding now through Peel and Action. They've got a stand downstairs, go and see these guys. We work with them on lots of different projects, and it's really, really useful stuff. You've heard already a few people saying Scottish Government in 2020 um, pledged to invest £250 million in peat and restoration over 10 years. Peat and restorations are improving all the time, so the techniques that are used now are very different from 10 years ago and they're working very far more effective um, and we've got more and more trained operators out there that can do it. You've heard from previous speakers, Peatland Code, the new version just came out this, this month. Um, and green finance, that could be a real game changer. That could really accelerate and speed up some of these processes. We know that quite a few private owners that own peatland on their estates are being approached at the moment with, with interest from investors. Increased climate res resilience of rivers, that's something our sector is really keen to try and do. We're really concerned about the, these dry drought summers and this is a, a technique to help deal with that. A key thing also is degraded areas will get worse if left. Crichton Carbon Centre that, that we work with a lot with and they're out doing a lot of the surveys, they say that they're seeing year on year some of the sites that they go really worsening now um, so fast, particularly these gullies because of the heavy rainfall that we're getting. So even if you haven't got a major problem now, you may if you don't help try and sort it out now. How long will it take to restore peatland to function naturally? That is a big question that nobody is really sure yet because some of our monitoring is starting to monitor some of the sites, restoration sites. We've been collecting a lot of pre-data and we're really interested in just how quickly it takes to function again naturally. And it is considered by my trustees at Gallery Fishery Trust that it's a priority area of work. We produce leaflets, we give talks, we get involved in trying to encourage Peat and restoration, we particularly work with a wide range of partners. And just a little slide here, Peatland and Action, they've been doing a lot of different work. This is, um, I nicked this off a talk they gave recently, and over eight years, 450 projects near, nearly that they've been involved in, a lot of feasibility studies, and that's a key thing for trusts and boards to think about getting involved in. You can be funded to go in and collect some of the data and the background information. And they highlighted 36,000 hectares on the road to recovery. That, by my calculations, is about 6% of the degraded peatland. So there's a lot more out there that needing fixed. That's me finished. Or ho hopefully you've all got a good idea that in many places, if you want to have a good, healthy fish population, you've got to have a good, healthy peatland pro um, as well. Thank you.